Hi, and welcome to lecture 15. This is the last content or technique lecture of the class, although there'll be some videos talking about the concrete problem that we're going to be working on next week. And now we've arrived at maybe the most commonly used feature other than graphics that you're going to want to have access to in Mathematica, which is solving equations. If you know anything about solving equations, you should anticipate that there might be some challenges here because there are equations that can't be solved with algebra, for example. And we're going to look at some of that as we go through the different functions available to us that we use in different contexts when we're solving things. So the first thing we have to note is that solving equations is hard. Famously, many equations don't have formulas that solve them, so that's the quintic polynomial. So degree five or higher polynomials do not have formulas in terms of algebraic operations and square roots that will solve the equation and say the way the quadratic equation will. So you have no guarantee that a degree five or higher polynomial is gonna be solved algebraically. Sometimes they might be, but in general they aren't. Other equations might be impossible to solve symbolically at all in any context. So if you have a function that mixes, if you have an equation that mixes algebraic expressions, polynomials, with transcendental uh, functions like sines and cosines or e to the x's, it's very likely the case that nothing you're going to be able to do is going to be able to isolate the variable x in that equation. It's just not going to happen. So a transcendental equation is not going to allow you to do that. In those cases, you basically have to work numerically. And you even have to be careful about what the approach is that you use to work numerically, which we'll see as we go through this. So let's start with the most basic command here, which is the command solve. So solve works exactly the way you think it should. Now it's important here, and maybe the most common mistake that students make, or actually your professors or programmers make when they're solving these things, is you have to make sure that you are evaluating your equations as Boolean equations and not variable assignments. Solve doesn't really like setting an entire function equal to zero as a variable. So the typical structure of solving is you can put an equation in here just with the double equals inside, and then you have to tell it what the variable you want to solve for is, in this case, x. It's not going to guess. It needs you to tell it. And when you do solve on a polynomial like this, if it doesn't find some sort of easy algebraic pattern it can use, what you're going to get is output that doesn't look numerical. And the reason is that what Mathematica is doing in the background is it's it's got a it's trying to preserve the fact that we used integers. And it thinks maybe you're going to want to manipulate these expressions later and it has to preserve them in an integer way because if you then do further operations and it's thrown away all the integers and replaced it with decimals, then you're not going to get what you want because once the integers are gone, that's it. They're finished. If an equation like this comes out with expressions that look like this is the answers, there are not algebraic expressions that easily solve it. And so in that case, you get these rules and these root expressions on the inside. You can extract the non-algebraic answers or numeric answers by just applying n. So if you do that, so you feed that thing into n, then what you get out is the evaluation of these algebraic you know, computer expressions in terms of the decimals that they represent. In this case, we've got complex numbers, right? So there's two complex roots here. You can also pr produce numerical answers using nsolve, and sometimes if you use solve and it fails, you can use nsolve to flip over to expressly numerical thinking, and those algorithms can solve. In this case, solve and nsolve give the same answers, but if you give nsolve, it skips the step where it gives you this type of root expressions up here and just tells you what the answers are. So in this case, we have six complex numbers occurring in conjugate pairs as we expect with a polynomial that has real coefficients. Another solver that you might have to use sometimes is the function reduce. And that will happen in cases where, say you have an inequality and the problem can't be solved in a, with, a, with a polynomial method that's going to give answers that are desirable. So this is not uncommon for solve to tell you when you need to apply reduce to a problem. So if you try to naively use solve to solve the inequality x to the third minus 2x squared plus 5 is less than 0, solve is just going to tell you, use reduce instead. So you do that. If you use reduce, well, we, we get another one of these root expressions because in the background, what Mathematica has done is algebra. 
So it's algebraically manipulated this expression to find what x is, and then you can feed that into the numerical evaluator and you'll get out the inequality that you were after. One thing that comes up often when we're working on an equation is we want to solve it with assumptions on the nature of the element we're solving for. Sometimes because we're not interested in solutions of another kind, sometimes because we're trying to get the solvers uh, an edge in the way that they apply things so they work faster. So if we solve the equation x to the x minus 10 is equal to x squared, but we also add the assumption that x is an integer, then we get integer solutions out. But the idea here is that if I want an integer solution, I have to add the assumption that that's true. If there's multiple assumptions to make, we could say add the, that x is in the integers and also um, x is greater than zero, you know, greater than two, say. And if we do that, we add that extra assumption, then you notice we've dropped the x equals one because the second condition that I added changed the nature of the solutions that were produced. Um, if you have a certain number of assumptions that you're trying to solve for and you only need one answer instead of trying to chase all of the answers down, you can use the command find instance instead. So find instance will always produce one answer, the first answer that it finds, and it also takes domain restrictions on the x without having to use the assumptions uh, construction that we used up here. Some equations are so challenging that algebraic solvers just can't handle them. So we were talking about transcendental equations before. Well, here's an example of one, a pretty easy one, it looks like. Sine x is equal to x minus one. So if I feed that into solve, it just tells you I can't do it. That's not a very heartening answer, but that's what it says. So then you think, aha, I know. I'm gonna use a numerical solver because I bet I could solve this numerically. And it tells you I can't do that either. I also can't solve it numerically. And then you think, all right, well, what, do I, what am I going to do? So what you're going to do at this point is you're going to use Newton's method, essentially. So you're going to use a root finder, which means we're going to transform this equation into something that Newton's method could be applied to. And that means that we, we're going to have to have some idea about where that root, right, where the point of intersection is that we're looking for. So when you're using solvers that involve root finders, you have to provide a guess to where that root is. So part of the procedure of using a root finder is identifying where a solution is. So if I plot sine x and x minus 1 and I look for their intersection, well, it looks like it's about x equals 2. So when I use the find root command, I have to tell it the initial guess that I want to take here is 2 because that looks pretty close. And then Newton's method, when you get close, for most functions, if you start close to the root that you're after, Newton's method should produce the correct intersection point. Sometimes that might fail. So badly behaved functions can actually, uh, so you know, functions with wildly oscillating derivatives, for example, or functions without derivatives at all, Newton's method isn't gonna work. In that case, you can use find root with two points, which is sort of you bracketing the guess, and then the way that that method works, you can learn in a numerical analysis class, but the basic idea is it's sort of walking its way in without having to use a derivative. Um, that'll work in cases where the Newton's method version fails, although it's a little bit slower. So this kind of approach to questions comes up all the time because many equations just don't have solutions that a numerical solver can find. And so you have to work one root at a time. So last thing we're going to talk about is a little bit of calculus and the bonus notebook this week is going to be about differential equations and so you're going to get a chance to really work on this stuff. So we've seen a lot of calculus already so we can recall we learned in a previous exercise how to take derivatives so that's the D operator and then you can actually do repeated derivatives not by doing D over and over again but by just telling it I would like a derivative with respect to X and then another derivative with respect to x, and you can see that you get 6x. We can go all the way here and say, how about x to the third, and then do three derivatives. And we get six. Okay, so repeated differentiation doesn't require powering. You could use the derivative command itself. Oftentimes it's easier just to do it this way. So there's no bias towards one or the other. Use whatever is convenient. I find this an easy thing to remember. Of course, that also means that partial derivatives are very easy with a sort of structure as well, because you can just take a derivative of a function of multiple variables with respect to x or y, and then 
you can show, for example, that the mixed partials of a function are equal to each other. All right, so here's your challenge. What is this theorem? So come to office hours and tell me what this theorem is and I'll know that you watch my videos. All right, so on the other hand, we could integrate as well. And we've already seen single variable integration, so I'm just gonna point out here how multivariable integration works with using a function that is not actually a formula just so we get a symbolic answer. And it's also important here because we wanna make sure that we're integrating in the correct order. So sometimes it matters what order you integrate in when you're working on a problem, for example. And in this particular structure, when we integrate with more than one variable, you'll notice here that if I integrate f and the first thing I write is x and the second thing I write is y, it actually reads this in backwards where it integrates with respect to y first and then it integrates with respect to x. And you can see that because if you switch the order of these guys, I must have f defined somewhere. Oh yeah, I did have f defined somewhere. Then you can see that you switch the order of integration as well. Okay. So let's look at a problem that involves uh, some calculus and actually some optimization as well. So the problem we're gonna look at briefly here is, so we're gonna look at a function of two variables, which is a surface that is defined this way. And we're gonna generate the graph of this second derivative over the rectangle from minus pi to pi, minus pi to pi. And then we're gonna to try to maximize that partial derivative, second partial derivative within that rectangle. So optimization problems in general are hard problems, right? Finding maximum and minimum values of a function over some region, that's a difficult question. But the graph part is easy at least. So let's just write it up the way that you might approach this. If you wanna do it in steps so it's easy to see what's going on, you might start by defining the function that you're interested in uh, working with. And then you could just compute its derivative, which will be a pile of symbols in X and Y. So you can see here, that the output of taking f and then taking its derivative is this partial derivative, right, dy dx. So then once I have that pile of symbols, I can plot it. So s here doesn't even need to be a function because remember that the way that plot3d works is with substitutions. So it's applying rules to these things. So as long as s is an expression of x's and y's, then plot3d is going to look at it and think, oh, I can plot that because I can just sub the x and y out. So when you plot that, you get this kind of gnarly looking ripply wave. And this is not something that you would want to try to optimize by hand necessarily. Take that derivative, which is deeply transcendental, and then find the point that maximizes it or minimizes it. Generally, when you're thinking of an optimization problem, particularly of anything more complicated than a basic polynomial, you should think you are never going to get an algebraic solution. I mean, it'll happen every once in a while, but the basic approach has to be that in general, you're not gonna get algebraic solutions. And so instead, what you should be thinking is work numerically because the numerical algorithms are faster and more accurate than the algebraic ones. So if I wanna find a maximum of this surface in the rectangle that we've drawn, then one way of doing that is with the command n maximize. So the n in front is that's a specification for numerical maximization. And then the way that we feed this in is a little different than the way you feed into plot because now we have the constraints fed in as explicit bands of constraints. So you can think here that really what we're doing is we have three different functions and we're optimizing against all of those conditions simultaneously. And then the X and the Y out here just tells us which, which are the variables of the expression. And what we get out of n-maximize is the maximum value and the place on the surface where it occurs. So now my question for you is, is there's a, a bonus question. Plot the maximum on the surface. And that might require that you look at mesh functions. So I'll leave that completely up to you to decide if you want to do that or not. Okay, and then we can just check and see that if we take our function s, which remember was the derivative, and we replace x with 3.14 negative and y with 2.57, that we actually get the maximum that was produced by n maximize. All right, so that is what you need for the basics of calculus. 
Um, I might put up another little short video about differential equations as we move into the notebook if there's a lot of questions about it, but I think you really need to get your hands dirty here. These problems are not as technically challenging as some of the stuff that we saw in earlier sections, but the ideas here are extremely useful for the sort of things that come up not only in your classes, but in the kind of day-to-day -day problems that a mathematician stumbles across, whether that mathematician is working in college or outside. All right, so I'll see you next time for some more Mathematica, and work hard, and I'll see you guys in Slack. Take care.